Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Timothy Lynch. I'm Professor in Political Science here at the University of Melbourne. You're all, all very welcome to join us for this hour long debate stroke discussion stroke webinar on lessons of the Ukrainian crisis for the Indo-Pacific. I'm delighted uh, to be joined by three excellent panelists. Dr. Diane Dan Hugh is Associate Assistant Professor and Deputy Director of the Australian Studies Centre at Beijing Foreign Studies University and Deputy General Secretary of the Chinese Association for Australian Studies. Dr. Hu teaches Australian, uh, the Australian economy and its economic relations with China. It's the only university course in China that features the Australian economy so frontally. And by Professor Robert Ross. Bob Ross is Professor of Political Science at Boston College and Associate at the John King Fairbank Center for East Asian Research at Harvard. He was a visiting scholar at the Institute for Security Studies, Peking University, a Fulbright professor at the Chinese Foreign Affairs College, and a visiting senior fellow at the Institute of International Strategic Studies at Tsinghua. Uh, he's also, though he may not admit this, given my errors on China, the first, uh, first man to teach me China many, many years ago. And by Professor Michael Wesley, uh, Michael is Deputy Vice-Chancellor International here at the University of Melbourne. He's responsible for leading the university's international engagement. His research focuses on Australian foreign policy, Asia's international relations and strategic affairs, and the politics of state-building interventions. His most recent book is Restless, Restless Continent, Wealth, Rivalry, and Asia's New Geopolitics. What I'm going to ask the audience to do is to pose questions in the Q&A function. As chair, I will get through as many of these as possible. I'll do a bit of sifting and filtering, but you're very welcome to be part of this conversation and to help guide where it takes us. Um, what I'd like us all to do uh, to begin with is to perhaps to reflect on, and this can be we may be leveraging uh, too much the Ukraine crisis into our own region. And the fact we're saying my own region doesn't, isn't sensitive to the fact that we're actually coming from different time zones. Bob is speaking to us from, from Boston. But I wonder if we could uh, react to the, to the notion that Ukraine has made the prospects of great power war in the Indo-Pacific more likely. And we're going to ask uh, Bob Ross to respond to that that uh, proposition first. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Tim. Pleasure to be here, honored to be here, and pleasure to join you as co-editor of the most recent edition of, the, of, your, of your online journal. So it, it, it is an honor. Um, the conversation on that issue tends to focus on Taiwan and would China take advantage of the situation in the Ukraine to use force against Taiwan? Or would America's long-term focus on Europe, its shift from Asia to Europe, help China give it more leeway to use force? And I think there's a mistaken notion, particularly in the United States, that if we don't deter other countries thereby use force, without taking into account the risk and costs associated with the use of force, regardless of America is effectively deterring or not, or part of the the calculus or not. And this is particularly the case for Taiwan. And we have to think about this in multiple ways. One, the logistics of a amphibious landing on the east coast of Taiwan, many have said would make the geography and the logistics of Normandy in World War II look easy. Mm -hmm. Second, there's the challenge of subduing a hostile population in a very difficult terrain on Taiwan. Uh, the, for those who, again, remember World War II, the terrain of Taiwan looks awful lot like Yugoslavia, in which the partisans were able to resist German occupation throughout the war. And so we put those two together, and we have the prospect of a protracted war, regardless of the United States is in that war or not. And then what we think is a protracted war for the Chinese Communist Party that cannot realize the rejuvenation of China by conquering small Taiwan, what does that do to the legitimacy and survival and the credibility of the Chinese Communist Party and to 
demonstrations, nationalism in the streets. You put these three things together and the mainland has lived with an independent Taiwan since 1949 because the costs of war, regardless of the United States, are simply too high. So I think we need to caution ourselves to think that, well, the Russians go into the Ukraine, the Chinese go into Taiwan. And if you look at the difficulties that the Russians are having, Taiwan would be much more difficult for the Chinese. So I think that's a much of an overblown concern. Now, if you're the United States and you reverse the coin, you're going to worry an awful lot because you're going to think, as countries do, you're going to worst case this, that countries will seek to take advantage of it. And indeed, during the Korean War, Americans were concerned that the Korean War would give the Russians, the Soviets, an opportunity to attack Europe. This is what countries worry about. So you are seeing the United States trying to reassert its credibility in East Asia mm -hmm. so as to reassure those countries that are focused on the Ukraine will not lead to adventurism on the part of others. But if you're the others, I don't see that risk happening. Thanks, Bob. That's an excellent start. Diane, what are your responses to this, this proposition? Uh, first, I'd like to thank Professor Lynch and Professor Ross for inviting me to contribute to, uh, to, contribute to uh, Melbourne Asia Review, uh, to which Professor Wesley, in spite of his really busy schedule, as TVC has also actively contributed. And I'd like to also thank Professor Lynch for uh, his kind introduction. And also, I'd like to add that uh, I'm affiliated to both BFSU and Melbourne Uni as well, and working also as Melbourne Uni as a research fellow, and also associated for the Center of um, Contemporary Chinese Studies. But uh, any opinion I expressed today, I would like to say upfront that merely represents my personal uh, scholarly view. So uh, for the question, I would like to say I'm a pessimistic optimist. <laughs> and while Ukraine, what has happened in Ukraine has certainly posed a really serious and challenging challenging questions to international relations and international law. I like to say it's still a bit too early to say great power war in the Indo-Pacific is getting much more likely. And essentially, I mean, to just give a short answer, uh, to, to give a short answer is I don't really see incentive in great power to engage in any hot war. So uh, yeah, I mean, but then uh, like many other like many others, I'd like to add that I, I am concerned about the prospect of war due to miscalculation or misjudgment. Thanks, Diane. That's that's very, very helpful. Uh, Michael, Ukraine has made the prospects of great power war in our region more likely. Thanks, Tim, and, and, and great to be on this panel. Um, can I give a shout out to Bob, uh, uh, acknowledging that it's past 9 p.m. on a Sunday night, Bob, so that is uh, that is commitment for you. Um, look, uh, I, 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 I tend to agree. I think that, and I, I must say that you can discount my comments here because I confidently predicted prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine that Putin wouldn't go that far, that he was uh, he was trying to, to secure what he wanted to secure short of war. So I've been wrong before, I could be wrong again. Uh, but I do, I do tend to uh, agree with Bob and Diane um, I think that um, uh, China will have been watching uh, progress in Ukraine very closely. Um, I think that at any time uh, when uh, um, what is called in the jargon uh, the offence defence balance, um, what uh, at any given time weapon systems do they favour uh, offence or do they favour defence? Um, I think that. Uh, uh, without question, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, Putin expected uh, to be able uh, to, to basically walk into Ukraine and take his objectives very, very quickly. I think he thought that the offence, uh, that, that weapons and, and, and material size and, uh, and, and, and scope would favour the, uh, uh, the uh, offensive side. I think what you, the Ukrainian armed forces have done is to demonstrate that actually the defence has the advantage here. Uh, I think that uh, given the fact that um, uh, the Taiwanese have been contemplating uh, a, a possible Chinese invasion since 1949, um, uh, they, will, they, they are very well prepared to defend uh, Taiwan. Uh, and I think that's what uh, would be giving Xi Jinping pause at the moment. So I, I actually don't think that uh, the Ukraine conflict has made 
uh, war in the Asia Pacific more likely. Thanks very much, Michael. <clears throat> Bob, let me ask you this first, and following on from what you've said, you've studied this country for your professional career, and you've re you regarded it as fundamentally conservative in its outlook. It's not an adventurous power that's seeking to conquer territory or build new empires, not on a kind of Western or even Russian model. Does that mean it doesn't, it's not opportunistic? So it can't see space, given what's happened in Ukraine, for its own, uh, to its own advantage. So, so does it, does it learn from the behaviour of other states, particularly Russia in this regard, or is its behaviour essentially fixed? I suppose that's a better way of ask, asking the question. What do you think? Well, first I want to reinforce what Michael said about offence-defence balance. Um, we add to the nature of weaponry, the geography, and we see the countries in East Asia are, not, are, are much less afraid of incurring an invasion from China than the European countries were fearful of a Soviet invasion during the Cold War. Yeah. Because of all that water, it's just hard to cross water. And that's a major contribution to East Asian security because you don't see a polarization. You don't mm -hmm. see the Philippines or Singapore, Malaysia hugging the United States because they're fearful for a war. Mm -hmm. And equidistant becomes viable because you don't need that strong deterrence of an alliance to avoid an invasion. And so I think that, again, that offense-defense balance is something that contributes to a, a more relaxed East Asia. Now, to your question on the Ukraine and China, I do think we're seeing China reminding Taiwan, are you sure you can depend on the United States when it's bogged down in Europe, Ukraine? So a flight here, an incursion here with aircraft, just a reminder, you know, we're here and the Americans are in Europe, in the Ukraine, in what looks to be a protracted presence with U.S. troops in Ukraine greater than any time in the last 15, I'm sorry, U.S. troops in Europe greater than any time in the last 15 years and likely to stay. And so the whole region's feeling this. How dependable is the United States in these circumstances? And so the Chinese certainly can take advantage of that situation, but that's taking advantage of to try and expedite and give momentum to the trend of the rise of China and the implications for other countries cooperation with China. That's different than saying we can now use force. So I think the Chinese are seeing an opening and they're quite gratified at events in the Ukraine and other countries are going to have to adjust. But that, and that will be a contribution. But overall, if we look at China, I tend to see Xi Jinping as someone who is quite cautious until he makes a decision. And then he can be quite determined and quite forceful. So when he decided to build those islands in the South Sea, bang, he was overnight going to do it right. Since he's done those, we haven't seen much in the way of, of adventuresome behavior, allowing the impact to have its effect over time. So, and as I like to say, he carries a big stick, but walks softly. That big stick is the Navy, but he doesn't use the, the Navy. It's the Coast Guard, it's the fishing boats, it's the presence. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, for those of us who are in academia and not in Washington, we only wish America could show such restraint in Iraq, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Bosnia, Syria, Libya, and so on and so forth. Yes, I think that's very good. That Beijing looks on recent American behavior, certainly since the end of the Cold War, and sees a series of botched invasions, most of which America eventually has to withdraw from. And yet it's... China that carries this this caricature of being the great aggressive uh, ideological power. It's not fought a war, you know, a, a proper kinetic war since 1979. As you've suggested, Bob, it it's more concerned with its claims on a deeply contest contested set of set of seas that surround its its coastline. So. My reticence here is to is to ascribe to Chinese behavior the kind of behavior we've seen in the US and more recently in Russia. And there are huge problems there. I think I think that's right. Let me ask Diane this, because I it, clearly the West's key 
mechanism for trying to bring Russia into line is economic. And we know they're also supplying weapons and they're starting to talk more rhetorically, offensively, but fundamentally, it's economic sanctions that are seen to do the job of, of troops and actual NATO missiles. What, how would you construe economics as a, as, a, as a means to realize national security objectives? You've studied economics and the relationship between China and Australia, particularly economically. What, what role is, should economics be playing? Um, thank you, Tim. Um, so the piece I, I wrote is really uh, to use um, Australia as an interesting case of study uh, to really try to sort out this dynamic between a geopolitics externally and then uh, policy towards the other, uh, diplomacy as what we say, and the economic uh, connections between the two countries. So how the how what kind of a dynamic there is between between all these factors and then and then the interesting thing about it and uh, just a little bit back to uh what you said about the uh, to what you said early on about the economics part of it and i'd like just to uh just just sort of uh jump to the shifting situation in foreign investment for the past um say five to six years is where we see this uh really uh widespread securitization of the foreign investment review uh amid this geopolitical shifts so of course that has a great uh, that that does have a great implication to china and also after covid uh what we have seen particularly the external environment for china gets more hostile, we are seeing China has taken action to sort of refocus its capital flow overseas, for example, more or less on the Belt and Road Initiative countries, but also initiating something like dual circulation to shift the focus back to the domestic landscape. So I think that is, that's, that is really that can partly answer what you uh, just now tried to suggest about this kind of uh, dynamics between the diplomacy part of that and also the economic or possible economic measures or sanctions. And do, do we, let me have a quick follow-up, Diane, do, do we overestimate China's economic strength? I mean, clearly rich and, 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 and wealthy with huge potential and a great record of success, but is it able to turn that economic strength into geostrategic advantage? Diane? That's a great question. <laughs> that's, that's, that's indeed a, a great question. Whether that can be taken as a leverage, I think that's really something to see personally. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that because I, I am seeing that somehow the efficacy of that is, is starting to prove uh, perhaps not as strong or powerful as, as intended. So yeah, that would be the short answer. Thank you. Michael, let me shift tack a little. I know you've got affection for a, a realist school that we call neoclassical realism. Realists tend to discount ideology, don't they? This is a neoclassical realism as a way of bringing that in. It isn't character, the character of a state, its history, its institutions. Isn't this crucial to explaining its foreign policy behaviour? What, what, what do you think? Uh, look, I, I would put um, a slightly sharper focus on it, Tim. I think um, I'm, I'm a great admirer of a number of scholars who have looked at um, the history of China's use of force. Uh, and I think we can uh, go back and we can learn quite a lot from how not only modern, um, the People's Republic of China, but China, of course, has a very, very long strategic memory and, and a very long tradition of uh, the use of force going back thousands of years. And, you know, famously Mao Zedong was a great uh, follower of uh, the classics of Chinese strategy. And I think Xi Jinping uh, is, is very much marinated in that uh, tradition. So uh, my sense is that uh, uh, China uh, thinks about force and the use of force and actually um, fits the use of force into a broad, panoply of statecraft that is highly sophisticated. Uh, my, my thinking is that uh, China uh, is probably 
predisposed uh, to uh, trying to get what it wants in international relations without actually going to war. Um, I think that is a very, very deep lesson from the history of Chinese strategic thinking, um, that actually going to war uh, is in a way um, a, a, a failure, that uh, if, you can, if you can achieve what you want to get without um, actually taking up arms, uh, that is the, the uh, sort of epitome um, the acme of statecraft for the Chinese tradition. And so I think um, that is uh, very much uh, the way that China is, is uh, operating at the moment. Um, uh, I certainly think that, yes, China would like uh, to uh, make Taiwan part of uh, the People's Republic of China by uh, 2049, but it would prefer to do it without, uh, without actually having to fight for it and fight as Bob said, a very costly war for, for, that, uh, uh, for, the, for that outcome. Um, I would also, Tim, you know that uh, this has occurred in a conversation between you and me before. I'm a big admirer of a book uh, called Shields of the Republic that was written by an American scholar, Myra Rapp Hooper, uh, a few years back, in which she points out that um, the revisionist powers, um, China, Russia, Iran, and others, uh, while the West has been busy solidifying uh, old alliance uh, organizations such as NATO, such as the US-Japan alliance, such as the US-Australia alliance, the revisionist powers have been thinking very hard about how to um, uh, exert uh, leverage and, and coercive influence short of, of, of conflict in the, uh, in, in, the, in the blank spots or the, the gaps in those alliances. And uh, I think she makes that point very well, mm. uh, that, uh, that Putin uh, attempted to try and exploit uh, the divisions and gaps in NATO, not very successfully, I must say. Uh, but I think China is probably thinking very hard about where American and allied red lines are in relation to Taiwan, what sort of pressure it can put on Taiwan. Uh, that, that is short of, uh, of, of conflict. And as I said at the start, I think this is entirely consistent with thousands of years of Chinese strategic history. Thanks very much, Michael. Bob, let me ask you this question. The, the China, despite some of the caricatures, does not sit at the apex of a huge web of formal alliances. If you think the actual, the, the kind of blood loyalty that America can command with states like Australia, for example, is almost entirely absent in Chinese history, in contemporary Chinese statecraft. Its closest ally is Pyongyang, which speaks to how miserable its alliance, uh, alliances are. Whereas the United States, I and mean, think of Russia, of course, it, it's got kind of crazy states that are supporting it, uh, or, 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 or at best there are ambivalent states that are abstaining on, on indictments of its behavior. Whereas the United States we know has Britain, has Australia, has France, has Poland, on and on it goes. Do, why do we exaggerate the strength that China has given that it's got really no natural allies in international relations? I wanna go back to your discussion about realism and, and Michael's perspective on the world and sure. use it to try and understand the role of alliances in US-China relations. We don't have alliances because we have friends. We don't have alliances because they associate with our political system or our ideology. America created alliances because we were weak. We were weak in Europe compared to the Soviet Union. We had to compensate by enhancing our commitment to formal alliances. We were weak in Asia because we were far away and maybe they couldn't trust us to be committed to Asian security. So we had to compensate for that distance by signing alliances with Thailand, the Philippines, South Korea, and Japan. China doesn't need alliances. The whole region knows that China is there, China cares, and that its interests are so strong that it's, it is a credible power. And so, it has very strong security relations, whether they like China or not, with Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, North Korea, growing improvement with Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines. 
without needing an alliance because they understand that Chinese power is always present and Chinese interests are paramount. Both of those don't occur with the United States. So many Americans would have said about the Ukraine, the Russian interests are paramount compared to the United States and their capabilities are greater than the United States. We shouldn't be challenging the Soviet Russia in the Ukraine. Well, that's how Americans might want to be looking at Vietnam, for example. In China's backyard, its capabilities are greater, its interests are greater. And what do we see? We see the Vietnamese accommodating China despite America's efforts because we're far away. So China doesn't need alliances, and yet it has very strong strategic relationships with all countries around its perimeter. So we need to understand that, that it's, it's, a, it's a canard, it's a red herring to say China has no alliances. They don't need alliances. You're listening to a webinar discussion from the Asia Institute, uh, and it's uh, in recognition of a new issue of Melbourne Asia Review, which Bob Ross and myself have edited. Some excellent selections there, considering the evolving great power relations of the Indo-Pacific. I'd encourage the audience to ask questions that, are, that you have um, at the front of your mind or ones that have been prompted by the discussion so far, and I'd be delighted to, to put them to the, the panelists. Um, Diane, if you were in a position of, if you were the Australian government, how would you be telling them to handle China in the current moment? Um. The first thing I want to admit is I do a uh, really serious problem both on the part of China and Australia of literacy and expertise issue. And for me, I would say our sound policy should be based on uh, sufficient literacy and also expertise on the other. However, um, well, it's, it's not just that the two countries now don't have their, you know, just a really reliable diplomatic channel to sort of keep the communication going on. But what we are starting to see is a really this lack of um, knowledge about the other that is lacking on both parts. So that's why for me as a Chinese, I would even say that some of uh, the policies that China has adopted uh, towards Australia could be better. and. In the same way that what we see uh, that what the Australian government has done towards China in terms of the China policy, again, could be better as well. So for the future, um, and I, I wrote a piece late last year about China-Australia relations doomed. And I'd like to say uh, pretty much in this contribution, I'm pretty much making, um, making the same point. He said, what I see right now is that with this, um, grouping of Western democracies, the kind of uh, space, diplomatic space left to Australia in China policy is increasingly shrinking. And also we're seeing a lot of um, domestic factoring as well. So with the federal election coming in, it's really tricky. And I think we, we, we may need a little bit to um, the end of May to see uh, what kind of a China policy can be formed. It's, it's certainly forced Canberra to, to rethink how it runs its, its China policy and relying just on the strength of trade is no longer enough. Seeking American protection from Chinese power whilst benefiting from its, from its wealth, it's a formulation that Hugh White came up with, is a very careful balancing act, which I think you illustrate really well. Uh, we've got a question from Ron, Ron Sharrock, but Bob, I'll put it to you. If... if what, what does Taiwan do in the current moment? Many of us in academia have been very concerned about the trend in Taiwan's policy, which seems to be challenging the status quo across trade relations. That is that we have Taiwan acknowledging that Taiwan is part of China, so on and so forth. And certainly Tsai Ing-wen has suggested she does not want to move in that direction. But in many respects, I give her considerable credit. She's done two things. One, she, her, provo her provocations about Taiwan independence have been fairly few. 
And over the last year or two, it's hard to find any. But she has drawn closer and closer to the United States every working day. Supports the United States on the Quad, supports the United States on ideological democracy against China. Um, giving aid to the Ukraine. She's been footprint around the world. In this respect, she might remind you of Singapore's foreign policy. A small country next to a very big country that wants to expand its footprint around the world, cooperate with the United States, not to achieve independence, but to be able to resist mainland pressures. And that's been quite successful. Because she hasn't crossed red lines on independence, she's getting away with a closer strategic cooperation with the United States. That includes arms sales, it includes U.S. naval transfers across the straits, it includes leadership visits by, the, by U.S. Um, civilian leaders and military leaders to Taiwan. And so we're seeing a new, U, new reliance in the United States as a security partner, even as she doesn't challenge um, the mainland on independence. Second thing she's doing, and echoes of Ukraine, She's the first Taiwan leader since 1950 to take island defense seriously. F-16s are now in the back burner. PAC-3s are now in the back burner. They're building submarines, but that's not the, the mainstream focus. She is now beginning to develop a reserve force, a guerrilla force, a protracted war capability. Plan says this would be a more difficult war next year than it was last year. She's trying to turn, if you will, Taiwan into, say, Cuba. The United States could have invaded Cuba any time, but the threat of people's war by Castro was a significant enough deterrence. And you're seeing that discussion come alive on, on Taiwan. So Taiwan's more secure than before, even as she's not provoking the man. Um, I think she can keep this up for a long time. The challenge, however, is not to cross those red lines on independence. So she's doing yes. the right thing. You've given us a brilliant description of the changes she's wrought. Yes. But is this the right thing to do? Does one look at Vladimir Zelensky and say, well, this is the way to resist a, a, a great big power next door to me? Is, is, that, is that an appropriate model? Well, certainly you wouldn't want to... Whether Ukraine did the right thing by finding itself in a war is a questionable proposition. How it fights the war, clearly they have done, they've been brilliant on that. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson from Taiwan is on both sides. You don't want to find yourself in that war, but if you're going to have to fight that war, make it a protracted war rather than a high-tech war. Mm -hmm. And she, I, I give her credit. Um, she has begun slowly to reform Taiwan's defense strategy, and I think in the right direction. Michael, what are your thoughts on on Taiwan? Is it is it doing the right thing? Is 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 the West more generally doing the right thing? Should should we be filling that island, not just with moral resolve, but with with kit, with weapons? Do we consider making it a, a nuclear power? What what's the what what what, what should the West be doing vis a vis Taiwan? Uh, look, I think. Um... First and foremost, uh, I think uh, building people-to-people uh, -people links with the Taiwanese is incredibly important. Um, every time I visited Taiwan over the past 20 years, it's really struck me how that democratic personality has really uh, deepened uh, among uh, ordinary Taiwanese people. That sense that um, they are extremely proud of their Taiwanese identity and they're extremely proud of their, their institutions and their robust democracy. Some would say that uh, Taiwan's democracy is too robust sometimes. I once met a French diplomat who was posted in Taiwan, who's, who, one of whose job it was to uh, count the number of fist fights in the Taiwanese parliament. So uh, it does get very robust at times, but uh, they are very proud of that uh, democracy. Um, look, I think, um, look, I, I, th I thought Bob's answer was really interesting. I, I didn't know that about uh, what Tsai Ing Wen was doing. And, uh, and that sounds like a, a really interesting development on behalf of uh, Taiwan. Look, I, I think that um, 
the Taiwanese will be watching the war in Ukraine with great interest. Uh, they will be uh, requesting, I think, uh, from the Americans uh, really quite detailed briefings about which weapon systems are working particularly well against uh, Russian attacks, and, uh, and they will be uh, taking a great deal of note of that. Um, and I think they will be uh, requesting similar weapon systems in future. Um, as Bob said, we've had a lot of, uh, of attention to F-16s and, uh, and, and high-end kit like that. Um, it could well be that, uh, that uh, you know, the Taiwanese opt for uh, much less flashy, but maybe more effective kit, um, uh, a la the Ukrainians. Well, let me add to and, that, Tim. Uh, by the way, sorry, sorry, Bob. No, go ahead, Michael. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I don't think nuclear oh, yes. weapons are on the table. I, I, I don't think the Americans would, would, uh, would be very happy about that. But sorry, Bob. Over to you. No, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. The mainland many years ago said that would be a red line for war to Taiwan go down the road of nuclear weapons. But interesting, uh, not big on to sell Stinger missiles to Taiwan. Uh, um, very effective against mainland helicopters should they try a landing. Um, I imagine we'll start selling Javelin missiles, Javelin artilleries to be able to personnel carriers should they try a landing. So this is, and the, a recent statement by the an Assistant Secretary of Defense said Taiwan need to, needed to focus on defense in depth, which of course is a euphemism for people's war or guerrilla warfare. So you can see the two sides are sort of moving together here. And it's about time. There's probably five to 10 years behind the curve, but finally we're moving in that direction. Diane, for a long time, under the terms of the end of history thesis or modernization theory, we've made the assumption that the wealthier and more interconnected economically the world becomes, the less likely war is. And that this is used as a way of, of justifying trade with China, that if we trade with it, if we help make it rich and it makes us rich, the vested interest in the maintenance of peace will be overwhelming and that will stop war. Is war thinkable in our region? And, and by war, uh, of course, I'm, my sense is, I think, cyber war, yes, and trade war, yes, but kinetic war, where Chinese troops are killing Australian troops or Vietnamese troops or et cetera. Is that thinkable? Um, sometimes, I mean, as as someone who spent most of her life in, in mainland China, I can, I can, I can confess that uh, for the past four to five years, um, the Chinese started to have that conversation to to talk about it. it, it, it will we be seeing a war? For example, the older generation will say, "Well, perhaps in our life there won't be war," but for your generation, it might be uh, something different. I would definitely um, agree that economic integration and also based on that people-to-people -people, uh, connections, understanding, and uh, that growth of expertise and knowledge of the other would definitely um, prevent war, or at least to make war more unlikely or more, more, more expansive. And like what we have seen um, with Russia and Ukraine lately, I think it's not just economic integration, but it's also about human mobility. It's about how individuals, life and your finance included, have sort of expanded or across the world rather than, you know, just like before sort of concentrated uh, within one border. So I think that would definitely, I would definitely agree with that. And also I would like to uh, sort of um, go back to what, what Michael was talking about, about the democracy, she, uh, the democracy he has, he has observed in Taiwan, is that I mean, when we talk about it, I mean, Australia is a perfect example. Is Australia has for such a long time had this deeper connections with people from Taiwan, so even even much much longer <laughs> than those from from the mainland. So I mean, I mean that's a fact. And also when you look at the leaders uh, in Taiwan right now, this generation of leaders, and most of them, they went to Harvard or they went to Yale and just graduated <laughs> with, with a law degree. So yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely part of that. But I can definitely share um, as 
someone who, who, who believed in the mainland and a sort of uh, know what they think. I think for, for, for most Chinese, I think we, we do understand that what China and the US agreed on, well, even though it's just a wording um, decades ago, uh, that has proved to be effective because that has left this space. And what we have seen the past decades is that this space has really allowed not just the mainland, but, but also Taiwan and also the whole area to get more prosperous. And if not, if not provoked, I don't really see any incentive on the part of mainland China to do anything to change that. It's a very good answer. Really very helpful, Diane. Michael, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll ask Bob that, 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 that same question that, if you're a realist thinker, I'm sorry, I keep trying to come up with workable notions of realism, which we could spend another several hours <laughs> unpacking. But if you're a realist, you acknowledge that war is, is sort of basic, if not to the human condition, to the international system, that peace, noun, period of preparation between two wars. are Do we lack in the West, I know the West is a complicated thing. Let me narrow it down. I'll ask Bob what he thinks from his vantage point in on the East Coast of the United States. But in Australia, are we cognizant, psychologically prepared for the advent of kinetic war, of, for, of, of real war? Or is that something we just, we're not prepared to, to countenance? I'll ask, I'll ask Michael that and then um, Bob. Michael. I'd, I'd make a distinction here, um, Tim, because I, I think it's important. I think we have to distinguish between great great power war and non-great power war. Uh, mm. we, we haven't seen uh, a major conflict between nuclear armed states, a direct conflict between nuclear armed states uh, since uh, the, the bombs were dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and I do think that uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, or at least the development of nuclear stockpiles and technology is a major um, threshold that hasn't been crossed. And I think uh, great all of the nuclear armed great powers would think very, uh, very carefully about crossing that particular threshold. Um, because, uh, of course, the consequences would be quite extraordinary. What we have seen is um, a series of wars essentially between great powers and non-great powers. And I think that's the sort of war where that, that we could possibly see uh, in this region. Um, are we psychologically prepared for it in Australia? Uh, I think that we have spent the best part of the last 25 years uh, gravitating much closer towards the United States. Um, I think that this is, uh, th this is a vital context. Um, uh, we are um, now predisposed to be much less critical about our alliance with the United States. Uh, anyone in Australian soft on national security. And uh, I think, uh, we are now much more interoperable with the United States. And if I can use a little bit of international relations jargon, I think that uh, the risks of entanglement uh, with the United States uh, have gone up quite considerably. Are we psychologically prepared for that? I don't think so. I don't think we're particularly materially prepared. I think uh, Australia, um, uh, has in its weapons acquisition decisions uh, made some uh, really questionable weapons acquisition decisions uh, and uh, is not particularly prepared either uh, to defend itself uh, well. Um, and I don't think we are particularly uh, well prepared to take our place alongside the United States and other allies in a broader uh, regional conflict. Thank you. But Bob, how, how do you assess the, the American readiness for war? Noting, of course, that America has spent 30 years getting into and then getting out of the various conflicts it's chosen to fight. What, what, what's, the, uh, what's the American attitude to conflict in, in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I, I think that distinction between great power war and local war is important. And what America has signaled clearly during the Ukraine war 
is that the United States will not engage another nuclear powers aircraft or military over the airspace or, or land of a third party because the risk of escalation to nuclear holocausts are too great. Sounds like Taiwan. There's a war in Taiwan would America engage Chinese aircraft over the airspace of Taiwan or Ukraine, a parallel that's exact, at the risk of US-China escalation to nuclear war. Now, of course, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If you're the region, you're going to be looking at this and everything that goes on in, on, in Ukraine and be concerned what the implications are for Asia. And if you're Taiwan, you're learning that the United States is less reliable than you may have thought, and that will give you greater impetus to do that guerrilla warfare and death and war capabilities, which is all good if you're Taiwan. Um, I might disagree a little bit with, with Michael on Australia. Um, Australia is developing Cocos Island for the United States as an air base. So the United States can project power into the South China Sea. The United States is working hand in glove with Papua New Guinea to develop the naval base in Manus, to enable the United States to operate out of there and into the South China Sea. So we're seeing some hand in glove operation. Where, and of course, Australia is expanding its air bases in Tyndall and elsewhere to enable the United States to operate more out of Australia in the Indian Ocean and in the Western Pacific. So Australia is doing what we would expect it to do. That is Australia's contribution to war is always gonna be nominal simply because of the size of the population. But its contribution of its geography to the United States can be quite significant. And that's what we're seeing with Tyndall, with um, Darwin, um, the discussion of new naval bases on the East Coast of Australia. Um, Australia is really having a forward leaning policy to assist the United States in its Indo-Pacific strategy, which is focused on the Indian Ocean. And I would agree that perhaps nuclear powered submarines is not the way to go for Australia, but it certainly ties Australia hand in glove to the US security system by cooperating in the most high-tech technology, similar, if you will, to the transfer of, of the THAAD missile defense system to South Korea that has less important for missile defense, but more important to consolidate the alliance. And so I think in that respect, I think Australia has really become the most proactive participant in the Indo-Pacific strategy, second perhaps to Japan because it's such well integrated with the US all these decades. Michael, do you want to come back? Look, I I, I, I agree with Bob. Um, I, I I just think some of our um, our I agree with him on the um, on the territorial or the the, the geographical point. Uh, you know, I, I but but I think that is uh, a part of the closer um, the growing closeness of uh, the Alliance for Australia. Uh, but I, I think that some of the defence material decisions that we've made are, are, are somewhat uh, curious and questionable. I agree with that. Can I bring India into the discussion? It's, it's puzzled many people in the West broadly can see that, that India wouldn't be backing the Western sanctions wouldn't be in the amongst Ukraine's key su supporters and we know some of the 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 explanations for this that India is is largely dependent on on weapons and guns made in Russian factories so how does how does the West uh, wean India off this Russian Teat, let me put it that way. What what do we do? What does the West do to try and make India the kind of geostrategic player in a that in a rather condescending way, Washington and London and Canberra have always thought it should be. What what are we misunderstanding about Indian interests in this in this current conflict? Bob first, and then Diane. 
So I think we focus on India's arms sale relationship with Russia as the cornerstone of Indian security policy. And it's not. The cornerstone of Indian security policy is how you deal with Pakistan, how you deal with China on the, on the northern borders, and how you deal with China in the Indian Ocean. And Russia is useless yeah. for all of that. So that we need to look at the military arms sales relationship as a commercial relationship, not one that contributes to Indian security regarding China. And India to the United States is similar to Australia, the United States. India cannot deal with the Chinese Navy in Indian Ocean, but it can contribute its geography to enable the United States to be more competent, more capable of dealing with China. And so you're seeing India build up the Andaman Islands and the U.S. beginning to have presence there. U.S. bombers landing on India, um, joined um, anti-submarine warfare exercises. Who's that aimed at? That's aimed at Chinese submarines. Now, big ships move slowly at sea. It's happening, it's gradual. You're not going to see an American footprint on Indian territory the way you do with Australia. One, it's not necessary, and two, ideologically, it's not possible. But that's not what the United States wants. It wants access, naval access and air access on the islands and on the perimeter along the Indian coastline. And that's happening rather quickly. Now, is that incompatible with arms sales from Russia? No, it's not. So that's going to go on. Now, why is India supporting those, not supporting those sanctions regarding Ukraine? Because it really, one hand it really doesn't have to, we're not gonna punish India. And they know that, so they can get away with it. And two, there's a lot of ideology and baggage of the non-aligned movement, which, in, which Indian politics um, is going to push in that direction. So put that together, minimal cost, domestic politics, it becomes a no brainer for India to say, we're not gonna support the sanctions. Now, of course it gives cover to China and other countries. So it's unfortunate for the United States, but I think it, it's not a very consequential move. Thanks, Bob. Diane. Well, um, not really as a part of the West. So <laughs> I'm afraid that would be a tricky question for me, but I would definitely think that India's response presents a uh, presents really a perfect case to say that realism is at work and how countries are really, you know, trying to balance between national interests and all the concerns and see how to prioritize them. And I would also like to add that this really fits into India's traditional stance of, you know, being this non-aligned non -aligned policy. And I'd like to say, well, I know that a lot of countries like Australia has done, has chosen otherwise, but somehow as geopolitical tension as escalates, somehow it would make good sense for countries to, you know, stick to that kind of non-aligned policy to sort of stay relatively neutral and some distance away from either camp. Sometimes that may, they may wing themselves more diplomatic space. That can make sense as well. Now, that's, that's a very helpful framing. And uh... Michael, what are you, what are your thoughts on India? I know India is present in your your mind at the moment. Indeed, Tim, I think we'll both both be there next week. Um, look, I think uh, I think our expectations of the way that India would have reacted to uh, the uh, the Ukraine conflict uh, illustrates the mistake of us assuming that because another country is a democracy, it will think strategically like we think. And I think this is the great weakness of the quad yeah. concept. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there, there is a lot of rhetoric about uh, four democracies, um, uh, you know, forming the quad. Um, and the, the, there is the assumption because uh, that because the United States, Japan, India and Australia are all democracies that we will become joined up on uh, strategic policy. I think pretty much about the only thing that joins us up is China. Oh and concerns about what to do about China's growing ambitions. Um, it certainly doesn't extend to other, uh, to other uh, conflicts in, in the world. Uh, Tim, I don't know if you were there when uh, we hosted at the University of Melbourne, the Indian foreign minister, mm -hmm. and he was asked a question as to why uh, India hadn't been more forceful in denouncing uh, the coup in Myanmar. And uh, he gave a, a classical realist answer. Uh, India shares a border with Myanmar. Mm. Uh, India and Myanmar share 
intelligence on insurgent groups that operate across that border. And so India's interests are, are in preserving a working relationship with uh, the Myanmar military. Um, so uh, I think that uh, we need to be very careful. And I think actually the situation in Ukraine is a timely reminder um, that, uh, that sharing uh, political uh, values does not mean uh, countries will automatically share strategic perspe perspectives. Yes, no, I, I, I agree with all that. Um, there's a the propensity in the, the West, again, broadly construed uh, towards strategic narcissism, that we assume the West, of course, is monolithic and that whatever it does will shape the behaviour of others. So everything is the West's fault and it's everything is in the West's gift to put, to put right. And what this discussion... Um, the, the necessary corrective that our discussion has, has provided is that states think of their own interests in their own way. And this idea that the US or the West or, or NATO is the one thing they all react to is, is all, has always been an exaggeration. Um, look, we've got only got a minute and a half left. I, and I, I'd just like to go round the, the Zoom room and ask, it's an unfair question, but I'm chair and get to ask unfair questions. What, where do you think we're going? What are your predictions for the relative stability of the Indo-Pacific, the prospects for war in this region, given where we are uh, in world affairs at the moment? I'll start with Diane, Michael, and then close with Bob. So, Diane. I think it's, it's a bit too early to say... Um how what has happened in Ukraine will shape the future. I think countries are watching very closely. It's not just how things unfold there, but it's also how other countries respond to it. So for the part of China, I'm going to repeat what I said just now. I don't really see any incentive on the part of China, if not provoked, <laughs> to change the status quo across the Taiwan Straits. Thanks, Diane. Michael. Michael. Michael, can you hear me? Michael's muted. Michael is now muted, by the way. I think he's he's frozen on us. Michael, can you hear us? So I, I, I'm, I'm happy to I'll go to, go, go to Bob and then I'll go to Michael. You froze, Michael, but let's go to Bob and then close with Michael. I'm, I'm glad you defined stability the way you did, because there's a tendency in capitals to say, China's growing relationship with the Solomon Islands could destabilize the Western Pacific. What we really mean is that the relationship with the Solomon Islands would change the status quo in China's favor. There is a difference. And if we associate stability the way you did with peace in the absence of major war, um, I think we can be fairly optimistic about that. Um, again, the presence of water, the US is now focusing on India, Japan, and Australia not Vietnam or Singapore, the Philippines. So, so we're beginning to adjust, even as we protest loudly about the rise of China and seek to contain, we are focusing on countries outside East Asia. China has no interest in using force anywhere in East Asia because the trend is clearly in its direction. Um, the rise of the Chinese economy is quite helpful to China to building a modern military, as we've seen. And I think that will continue for another decade. And of course, the rise of the Chinese economy has led to very, strong Chinese ability to use sanctions, and whether it's against Vietnam, the Philippines, um, South Korea to achieve its objectives peacefully. So if we define stability as not the absence of politics or the absence of coercion, but the absence of war, I think both the United States and China are finding ways to achieve their objectives without war. Thanks, Bob. Michael. Look, I, I agree with that. Um, the interesting thing for me uh, is to what extent polarizing pressures will take hold in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, in a way, uh, there are strong polarizing pressures acting at the moment. I think technological decoupling is a big uh, element in polarization, but there is also a very strong, uh, very um, uh, long history of avoiding uh, choosing sides, particularly among Southeast Asian states. So that is going to be uh, really interesting. But I, I, I agree uh, that uh, 
um, given all those caveats and 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 in uh, the absence of uh, an accidental outbreak of conflict, I think that uh, that uh, the the region will continue to evolve relatively peacefully, uh, but as Bob said, not not necessarily without the use of coercion. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's time for us to close now. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, been a part of a really excellent conversation, which has helped me think more clearly about some of these issues than I was thinking an hour ago. Can I thank uh, all the panelists for their making the time in different time zones, in Bob's case, and for their brilliant uh, uh, responses to questions from myself and from the audience. You've been listening to a podcast from the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. The Melbourne Asia Review is an initiative of the Asia Institute and contains many of the thoughts and arguments that you've heard here this afternoon, and I would commend that edition to you. My thanks to Scarlett for running this session, and I hope to see you all um, on a Zoom or even in a real room uh, very soon. Take good care out there. Stay brave. Goodbye. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everyone.